Welcome back to Neckbeardia. You know why you're here. You clicked on the title because you saw what it was called. So let's get back to Stranded in Fantasy. Journal Entry 271. We made it to the plains and got close enough to observe the situation. The barbarian war camp was in shambles. Panic everywhere. It looked like they were recovering from artillery though they are out of spell and catapult range. It was total chaos. Then we found the cause. There is a loud bang, audible from even here, and a second later, an explosion erupted in the middle of the barbarian ranks. It was artillery. Jason confirmed that was fired from Winterfield. Mortars. A few minutes later, another one fired. After several shellings, barbarians finally pulled into a retreat, heading in the direction of their supply camp. We held our position on the hill. An hour later, the front gates of Winterfield opened and their militia stepped out. It looked like they were scavenging the barbarian camp for supplies. People started coming out to join them. Some were fighting over what food they could get. We decided to pull back and moved into our old crypt base for the time being. We'll let them recover a bit before they decide to steal everything of ours because they're starving. This begs the question though, who introduced mortars to Winterfield? The same person who was sending cannon materials to Wolf Lake? More and more questions just seem to crop up. Journal Entry 272 We let things set for a few days and then we rode out to the city. The gates were opened and there was a large watch out front. A group of civilians were digging a mass grave to hold a large mound of corpses nearby. Other than that grisly sight, things were looking less desperate. Upon approach, the guard out front drew their weapons. We stopped and explained ourselves. That we were adventurers and what we had been doing out here against the barbarians. We were given clearance to enter but warned that food was on short supply. Doesn't look like we'll get our hot meal. They also mentioned that the provisional government is hiring mercenaries to bolster their armed forces for their upcoming actions against the barbarians. We noticed, upon entering, a brand new mortar sitting within the walls. Only one. It was surrounded by some guards and what looked like an alchemist. We tied up our horses and went over to talk to them about it. They wouldn't let us near the thing, stating state secret. I did get a quick glimpse into their minds, nothing that would point them out as Terrans. I would need a longer session to find out where the gunpowder came from. It can't be from the Wolf Lake Orcs. Only a handful of them knew the recipe, and how would have even gotten here? We're going to check into this better tonight if we can. Jason paid a visit to his guild. We met him later at the graveyard. We paid our respects to Amanda's grave. Avery said a prayer for her. Then we checked into an inn and paid with a loaf of bread, which is worth more than gold right now. Journal Entry 273 The city has seized our horses and sent them to be processed for meat. Just like that. They did pay us, but it was a pittance. At least they had the decency to give us the saddles back. Avery was ranting about it all day. So before we had anything else seized from us, we decided that we weren't done with the barbarian issue, so we signed up as mercenaries. The pay looks to be pretty good and we get free rooming. Food is another problem because of the shortages in the city. They're already running up to Brightly to see if they can get anything shipped over. So we're quartered with two other adventuring groups who were both trapped in the city when the siege began, who had been on their way to Alien at the time. Several warriors, some spellcasters, a money paladin, and a cleric of the Peace Church. We all got to know each other, related stories, and so on. I don't trust a paladin. He doesn't seem untrustworthy, but I haven't had the best experiences around them. Journal Entry 274 We finally got a chance to pay a visit to that alchemist. I went along with Jason. We slipped inside once I could confirm that he was alone. We took him by surprise and I mind stunned him. Set him down and dug in while Jason kept watch. I did get some worthwhile information from him. One of the Sun Church priests approached him one night and delivered a note with the chemicals and a process for making the explosives, along with diagrams explaining how to build the mortar and shells for a blacksmith or bell maker. The Sun Church again. They don't even have a branch here. The alchemist had to swear an oath of loyalty to the church for the plans, a magically binding one. He did so any way to break the siege. The priest hadn't been seen since. 
I cleared his mind of the incident and made him think that he slipped. We're going to have to start keeping an eye out for this priest. Journal Entry 275 We scoured the city looking for any word of a sun priest staying. A few innkeepers recall such a man a few months ago, but he seems to have disappeared as mysteriously as he appeared there. He showed up at the inn after the siege had started, when the innkeeper wasn't expecting any new visitors. But there he was, and then he checked out well before it had broken. Chances are that he isn't in the city anymore. So why would he come here to do this? Why? How is the Sun Church involved in this? What else do they know? Are they holding old literature from the last group of Terrans? Anyways, I picked up some new clothes on the market. My current set had just reached a point where they were being held together by the good graces of decency. So us mercenaries are being sent into the field tomorrow to do some scouting work. If I still had my damn horse, this would be a cinch. Journal Entry 276 We were broken into groups of three, patrolling specific routes and set up to meet up one location, near the Barbarian Supply Camp and then head back after gathering what information we can. A two or three day trip. I was with Alex and one of the other adventurers, a tiefling guy. What the hell is wrong with their chins? Says he's a ranger of some kind. So we're set to visit one of the abandoned farmsteads along our route. We get out there around nightfall, poke around. I don't detect anyone. All the farm animals are gone or dead. It looks like some of the fields are still harvestable. So we go inside the house and check around for anything we can use. They got a barrel of booze in their kitchen, but it smells funny. There is some kind of preserved fruit and some salted meat, so we have some of that. Then sit around the fireplace and tell stories. Alex and I decide to completely befuddle the guy. So after he tells us about his adventure fighting one Italid in some drow in a cave system, I tell him the story of Morrowind. He doesn't get what the fuck I'm going on about. Alex decides to one-up me and tells him about the Emperor of Mankind, except he's using all the local races. He thinks we're both insane now. Journal Entry 277 So we continue on our patrol route and finally reach our meeting point, an old compass marker in the fields. Over the course of the next few hours, everyone starts arriving. Avery's group ran into some hunters and managed to put them down with some effort. Jason and Mike's team got lost because of their team leader. Marcus amusingly got stuck with both a cleric and a paladin. He wasn't happy. I think this is the longest he's gone without getting any. We exchange notes and head over to see what the barbarians are doing in their camp. They're all in some kind of huge ritual with dancing around a totem of corpses, smoke, and chanting. Mike's under the impression that's some kind of weird devil summoning. We quickly leave and continued to travel through the night. We made it to the city a little after midnight to inform the guard of what we saw, and then headed to our quarters to get some rest. Journal Entry 278 We are prepared to leave in the morning with the main militia force and start our attack on the barbarian horde. All us mercenaries are hanging out in the tavern. Mike finds out one of the girls is also a warlock, the two have an instant connection. They spent several hours in a corner excitedly talking and throwing emotions all over the place before running off from one of their rooms. Good for him. I don't think Mike's gotten any since we've been here. Unless they're running off to perform some in infernal ritual. <laughs> Fucking warlocks. Anyways, I paid another visit to Amanda's grave. We threw in some money to get her a proper headstone made, written in English. I wonder what she would have become if she made it. I could almost feel her presence again. I'll get those barbarians for you, Amanda. You just rest. If I could change history, I would have never have gone down into the hold. I would have never reached out with my mind and tried to figure out what was in that crate. Maybe the monster wouldn't have awoken and made the airship burn. Maybe you'd still be alive. Journal Entry 279 We were out in the field, marching with the rest of the militia. We are wheeling along the motor as well while more are being made for the city. It's only a matter of time before they figure out how to make a regular cannon from it. That's the one thing that big gun powder weapons have an advantage in. Range. They'll outrange a regular mage by a great deal. 
The commander of this force plans on setting up his force in a phalanx when the battle begins while us mercs will act as skirmishers and try to assist the formations in any way possible. Again, this would be easier if we still had our fucking horses still. We're not sure what to expect from that barbarian ritual. Maybe it failed. Maybe it wasn't real. Maybe it summoned an entire fucking army. In the meantime, it looks like they got the airship route re-established as one was arriving while we were out. It'll take weeks or months of food deliveries before the city will fully recover. Possibly years of farming to rebuild their stores. Journal Entry 280 They did, indeed, summon an army. A devil army. I don't know what deals were struck for this. I don't want to know. Our forces nearly panicked and ran, but between the commander's words and the malicious bars throwing around inspiration and bravery, we managed to hold cohesion. There were many strange shapes and forms out there, and we could make out their leader, standing in front of the rabble with a flaming spear. Mike said it was an Erinias, and wanted to list all the others present. Then they just came for us. The phalanx formed. Avery and another cleric lit up like a holy beacon. I noticed that none of the others did. The barbarians came in from the back, using the devils as their shock troops. Several of the phalanx formations were immediately destroyed while others pressed forward. Our group did its best to harass the enemy. I was picking up the weirdest mental traffic from them. They were avoiding us, the Terrans. An order of some kind? When one of us would attack, they'd pull back and try to avoid or engage someone else. Even trying to use this to our advantage, the battle was going bad. Then the mortar started firing. The enemy line was completely thrown in disarray. Unfortunately, we only got five shots off before the mortar exploded, killing its fire team. We certainly decimated the barbarian horde, but the Devil Army was a bit more difficult. The commander finally ordered a retreat and everyone made a run for the city. All of us mercs decided that we didn't want to get caught up in another siege and split off. We've taken refuge inside our old crypt base. Avery, the other cleric, and the paladin are going around trying to holy up the place some. Maybe keep the infernals away over the night. Journal Entry 281 Luckily, we had no infernal visitations over the night. We do have a plan of action, though. Mike and his warlock girlfriend believe that the barbarians are the anchor keeping the devils here through their ritual. If we kill them, or at least the right ones, the army should dissolve, or they'll return to wherever they go. With that in mind, we packed up and headed for the barbarian camp. A horde of adventurers off to save the day. On the way, we noticed that the Devil Army was sieging Winterfield pretty hard, as we had expected. The rain of arrows from the walls was barely keeping the Devil forces from attacking. The Devils had no siege machines with them, though I suppose some of the larger ones could count as living siege engines. I'm not sure how long it would take for the city to produce more mortars, but they probably didn't have enough time, and I doubt they'd be in any condition to deal with a devil invasion of the town when the gate inevitably fails. It probably doesn't help that we have most of the holy types with any kind of ability with us. Journal Entry 282 we made it to the barbarian camp at nightfall. It looked like they're preparing another ritual with all the corpses from the battle of the day before. We made our move. Jason and the rest of the sneaks went ahead to silence the guard. The rest of us moved in when we got the signal. All hell broke loose. Our hell, this time. All our spell casters unleashed upon the ritual performers. The rest of us picking off anyone who wandered out of the blast zones. After the spellcasters blew their load, it turned into a real battle. We were outnumbered, but we had every other advantage. We let the non-combatants flee, the non-warrior women and children, and pets. When the sun came up, we held the camp. We had casualties and many wounded. No Terrans died this night, though Alex ended up with several broken bones when he ended up wrestling a barbarian, and Mike was debilitated by the tribe shaman's magics. Our clerics and paladins were healing everyone as best as they can, 
In other news, I found out why the local scions shaved their heads. By late battle, I was starting to burn out. I gave my last good concentrated mind rate blast, my last bit of everything, and then my hair caught on fire. I got it out in time, but I'm going to have to be more careful about this. I am not shaving my head. Journal Entry 283 We have horses again. After we got everyone that we could get back on their feet, we took the barbarian horses and rode out to the city to see if our plan worked. Well, it did. Kind of. Only a quarter of the devils remained and they looked disorganized. We made our plan and rode in. Our spell slingers started hitting them from range. Our clerics putting up their divine barriers and whatnot. The city militia took our cue opened the gates, and went out in force while the rest of us engaged the devils. Again, they were avoiding us Terrans, but that didn't stop us. By the end of the battle, the devils had dissipated. We all had injuries of some sort, mostly burns, but damn, it felt good. The barbarians were no longer an immediate threat to the region, and we actually saved a city. Of course, they still took our horses for food, but we got paid a little better this time. We got our merc pay as well. Considering all the effort we put in, and our losses, I feel like we've been shafted. I can understand that the city doesn't have much to offer right now, I guess. Journal Entry 284 Things are doing better around town with the immediate threats put down. The militia went over and raided the barbarian camp for anything left behind and brought back some supplies that should help. The farmers are returning to their farmsteads. The other adventure teams are sticking around a few more days before heading to Aegean. We told them of New Chicago and warned them they better not fuck around with its inhabitants. We should probably be going with them, but I don't think any of us are ready for another week's long voyage across the wilderness. I think we're all just exhausted. We did complete what we set out to do, and it was a lot of work. We do have some peace of mind, at least. I paid a visit to Amanda's grave, had a talk. I know it's silly, but I swear I felt her presence, her standing there listening. Anyways, I'm going to run off and meet up with Jason, Marcus, and Alex. Jason wanted to explore the castle, as it's currently not being used. Avery doesn't like the idea, and Mike is doing the warlock thing with his girlfriend. The provisional government closed the castle down when they formed, and have been running everything from a repurposed courthouse in the middle of town. Maybe there's something of value inside. Journal Entry 285 We spent hours going through that damn castle. It's been ransacked pretty hard already, probably during the city's civil war. After a few hours, we finally just gave up and hung around the throne room for a while. The throne had been destroyed for whatever reason. I don't remember being covered in anything valuable, so maybe it was just in spite. Anyways, after a few minutes, Jason says he sees something and goes over and starts playing with one of the back walls. Sure enough, there's a click and a hidden door pops open. Okay. We figure it's an emergency escape exit for the king. We grab our lights and head in. Well, the stairs go up, so it's not an emergency exit. We end up on the fourth floor in a room with no other doors but a few small window vents too small to crawl through. The floor of the room has a massive ritual circle painted on it, and what's more important, a portal sitting in the middle of it. Unfortunately, it wasn't a portal home. It looked like it exited out into a forest. Alex said it looked stable enough. He tied some rope to a chair in the room and tossed it through to make sure it wasn't going to dissipate immediately and that we could return through it. We drew straws and I lost, so I got to go through first. Sure enough, there's a portal on the other side so we could return easy enough. The portal exited out into a forest clearing. The whole clearing was in another ritual circle. Jason said it's an invisibility field. Alex thought it was some kind of repulsion field. What's more important though was that in the middle of the clearing, a small airship just sitting there with the Winterfield Royal Seal painted on the side. This was, in fact, an escape route, a way to leave the kingdom. One that must cost a damn fortune to build. We had a emergency team meeting. 
We still need the consensus of the others, but as far as the rest of us are concerned, we're going to graciously accept this gift for the loss of both sets of our horses and saving the city. Journal Entry 286 We got the others over here and showed them our new prize. It took some convincing to get Avery to agree. She doesn't like the idea of running off with something this expensive, even if the previous owner is dead. So, first thing was first, making sure that it actually works. Well, we ran into our first problem. The magic key fob was missing. Everything else seemed to be in working order, but we can't get it to budge without the key. From what we've seen on other airships, the key fobs were usually a glowing sphere around the size of a baseball, and they sit in a slot in the middle of the wheel. We went back through the portal and scoured the castle looking for it. It wasn't hidden in the throne room, it wasn't in the king's chamber, it wasn't in the armory. If it had been in any of those places, it was long since gone. We closed the secret door, snuck out of the castle, and looked around town. We checked with merchants, casually asking if they had any magic spheres. Nope. This could be a problem. None of us know how to hotwire an airship. Journal Entry 287 our next targets were the heads of the provisional government which is made up of the old military general, several of the advisors, and one of the nobles. All of which were fighting against each other during the civil war, but joined forces when the barbarian attack began. We had Jason figure out their schedules. Marcus intercepted them when we were ready, and I mind read them while Marcus kept them distracted. Only one of the advisors knew anything about the airship, and I think he may have forgotten about it. No idea what had happened to the key. Last he knew of it, it was in the throne room. I made sure he wouldn't remember the airship, and we continued our search. We hunted down personal servants, elite guard, Jason asked the Thieves Guild. Nothing and no sign of the royal artificer who may have built the thing either. He's presumed dead in the Civil War, and his house burned down. Figures. Journal Entry 288 So come morning, Marcus says he has an idea. The king had an ugly concubine, a curvy half-orc girl with a bad case of man face. She would have access to it and may have been close enough to Nova's existence. We managed to track her down to a small residence, relatively close to the castle. So Marcus goes up and knocks on the door, and she comes out. Sure enough, she's got the damned fob. She drilled a hole in it and was wearing it like a big glowing medallion on a necklace. Anyways, we grabbed it and I erased the whole thing from her head. Yeah, we pretty much keep shitting up this poor girl's life. We killed her sugar daddy and now we're running off with her memento of him. I tried throwing in some happiness and dropped in the seed of determination to start anew. Maybe one day, with a mask or a cloth sack, she can attract a new man into her life. Anyway, while we're preparing, I stopped by Amanda's grave to say goodbye. I could have sworn she answered me back. Wait, what? We need to look into this. Journal Entry 289 So someone read my journal last night. We were supposed to be flying out of here, but Avery seems to think that I'm making mental contact with Amanda's ghost, which means she didn't pass properly. Avery ran off to borrow some books from one of the local churches while I sat around at the gravesite trying to make contact. I definitely felt something out there. So Avery returns with her books and we pull over them trying to figure out what can be done. We found a ritual that would let her manifest. Avery's jittery about the whole thing, dealing with the undead like this, but it's something she has to do. Mike says it looks similar enough to one of his infernal rituals, that he can help, and he does. So we perform the ritual. At first there was something like a white smoke drifting around, and then it became more defined. It took on her form. It was Amanda, white and translucent. She's been here the whole time. Luckily, she hasn't gone insane. She couldn't talk, but I could feel from her. So we told her of our adventures. Alex going to Alien, Avery joining us in the York campaign, our rescue of Austin, Max and Ian, Marcus and his wife and son, and our campaign against the barbarians. She was glad that we were all safe and making a life for ourselves. Then it felt like a burden was lifted from her, and she... Faded away. She waved goodbye. 
Avery seems to think that she was worried about us, and that was keeping her bound here. I hope she's getting the rest she deserves, now in whatever afterlife she ended up in. Journal Entry 290 We have gathered supplies and subtly moved all of our stuff to the castle and then to the hidden airfield. It took a good two hours to scrape off the damn Winterfield Royal Seal. We loaded up and then stalled before we realized none of us are qualified to fly this thing. We've seen airships piloted, but actually piloting them is a different matter. The controls look simple. A ship's wheel, an inset orb next to it that we think controls altitude by rolling it in a lever that we think controls speed. We sat down on the deck and had a discussion of who was the most qualified of us to pilot it. After an hour of getting nowhere with that, Mike had an idea. Whatever happened to that captain we arrived with on our first trip here? Is she even in town anymore? And can she pilot airships? So Jason and I returned to the city and scoured for her. Sure enough, we found her, working as a tavern wench, saving for enough to start up her own landbound trade route with Briley. She did in fact know how to pilot airships and was more than willing to be hired onto our crew as long as we paid her more than what she was making at the end. So we got a new member on the team, airship pilot Marika Hajna. We got all loaded up again, detached from the air dock, and lifted off. It was amazing. Then we realized we had no idea where the fuck we were. I figured we were in the woods between Winterfield and Brightly, but Alex pointed out that the trees were wrong. We could be north or west of the kingdom borders. We flew in wide circles for hours until we spotted the coast. So we had to have been west of Winterfield. We started by heading east, and by nightfall, we are passing over the city. So we wasted a day. We came in and landed at the airship port and hoped that no one would recognize the ship. We registered at the dock for the night. There was no fee. Come morning, we'll begin our trip to Aeon. Maybe we'll take some passengers and make some extra money. And that's the end of this chapter of Stranded in Fantasy. If you like these Stranded in Fantasy stories, be sure to head over to Nerd Beardy and check out the Veil Rider series. It's kind of the same way, but with machine guns and 50 cals. As always, if you like these stories and like stories like them, be sure to subscribe to Neckbeardia and click the bell icon so you know when the videos are released through the week. Additionally, down below in the comments, just post what you want. After all, they're always fun to read, no matter how good or dumb they may be. Additionally, Neckbeardia is only around 5,000 subs away from hitting the 100,000 subscriber mark, and personally, I cannot wait to see Neckbeardia put his ball sack on a fucking play button. This has been Guardbro, and I'll see y'all next time.